Thanks for joining us today. This is Pastor David Holt's first sermon from the newly planted Living Hope Church. Lord, we stand amazed tonight that you, the perfect, spotless, righteous, pure, loving, kind Son of God, would take our sin upon yourself, would bear the judgment that we deserve so that we could be free, forgiven, accepted, brought into your family. We worship you. We thank you. We exalt you, Jesus, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you for your precious word. God, your word gives life. Your word gives encouragement. Your word gives conviction, but when it does, it, it convicts us so that we might repent and be restored. So that we're forgiven and accepted and once again put on a track toward hope. We love you. We worship you. We commit this message to you now as, as you speak to us through your word. God, speak to me. Might your word speak to every person here in a fresh and real way. In Christ's name, amen. You may be saved. Amen. If you have a Bible, take it out and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll share tonight a message. Is living hope possible? Not is it possible that there be a church called Living Hope. <laughs> That's obviously happened and you're here to be a part of that tonight. But is, thank you guys. But is living hope possible in terms of our lives? Is it possible to experience living hope in our lives? And that by that I mean... A hope that's living, a hope that's daily, a hope that actually um, takes effect in your life. Because we, doesn't, we don't have to look very far around us to see that our world is in desperate need of hope, isn't it? Desperate need of hope. So many people are struggling today. They're struggling to find hope. They're struggling to find purpose. People are, are in fear and anxiety and depression and addicted to drugs and alcohol. Marriages are failing. Children are struggling with their parents and parents with their children. And just this week with the, with the Boston bombing and people now living in incredible fear even on our soil of, of various terrorist attacks and all kinds of things. Just two weeks ago, an elderly gentleman was killed right out here on Lexington Road trying to cross the highway. And so there's tragedy and sorrow and pain and needs all around us. So this week on Facebook a post, 20 years ago we had Johnny Cash, Steve Jobs, and Bob Hope. Now we have no jobs, no cash, and no hope. <laughs> and maybe that's the way you feel tonight. Maybe tonight you're struggling to have hope. So what do we mean when we say hope? Well, here's the definition I'm working from tonight. Hope is a confident and positive expectation of the present and the future. It's a confident and positive expectation of the present and the future. And we're going to learn tonight in God's Word that hope is possible. That God wants us to live with hope. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, I'm just going to go phrase by phrase through two verses of the Bible tonight. And, and in these phrases, you're going to see five reasons why we can have living hope in our daily life. I want to encourage you with this tonight. And so if you have a little uh, sermon notes in your uh, brochure, you can pull those out. There's going to be some fill in the blanks. Tell you what, um, let's stand as I read God's Word. By the way, if you don't have a Bible and you need one, there's a little table in the back, three uh, Bibles, there's some other books and little pamphlets to help you grow spiritually. Take anything on that table that you need. I'm reading from the ESVs, 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again with living hope. There it is. This is the passage that we base the name of this church on. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Amen? You may be seated. Five reasons why we can have living hope. Reason number one, we can have living hope because God is merciful. Look at that phrase. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to His great mercy. That's an amazing statement. God of all the universe who created heaven and earth is a God of mercy. The God of the universe 
who in his essence is holy, perfect, righteous, and has every right to judge and condemn us because we are far from perfect, far from holy, full of sin, full of rebellion, full of going our own way. God is holy. And if He were merely holy, we would be consumed by His wrath and judgment because that's what we deserve if we only took His holiness. And so you can't understand fully His mercy if you don't understand His holiness because He is a God of purity and He's a God who must judge sin to be consistent with His nature. And yet the Bible says that mercy triumphs over judgment. James 2. How could mercy triumph over judgment? Because Christ bore the judgment of God for you and me. Isn't that good news? Because Christ bore the judgment and the wrath of God for us, for the believer, mercy triumphs over judgment. And we can have a God who is full of mercy and love and compassion. When you understand that God is pure and holy and what we deserve in our sin, then all of a sudden you realize the power of the cross and what Jesus did for us at the cross, then His mercy all of a sudden is understood with profound gratitude. And that gives hope that God is full of mercy. Notice it says He's great in mercy. Not weak, not a little mercy, but great mercy. <laughs> this is good. Great mercy because we have great sin and great need. Great mercy for our great daily need. And the Bible says in Lamentations 3 that his, his mercies are new every morning. Isn't that good news? Every morning there's new mercies because there's new need on our behalf. Every need you have, there's a mercy of God to meet that need. Every pain, every hurt, every suffering you have, if you draw near to God, there is a mercy that can be extended when you come to God on His terms. He loves to pour out His mercy. That's good news and that gives hope. That gives daily living hope because every day we need His mercy. 1 Peter 5 says that God opposes the proud but He gives grace to the humble. And so when we humble ourselves and we admit our need and we acknowledge that God, I'm desperately in need of you, then His mercy and His grace kicks in and He loves to do that. Second reason, we can have living hope. This passage teaches that God pursues us. And when you first look at this, you're going to go, how in the world does he get God pursues us out of this phrase? But bear with me. He has caused us to be born again. Does that mean that he caused us to be born again? Does that mean that he forces people to get saved? Does it mean that we have no choice in the matter, no free will? Well, what about verses like Romans 10? All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What about John 3, 16? As many as believed, he gave the right to become children of God. That's something we do, right? Yes? Keep in mind this is written to those who are already saved. Verse 1, written to the elect. What I think this points to is this. That salvation from beginning to end is all God's doing. God gets all the glory, all the credit, because all of salvation from beginning to end is God's doing. God took the initiative to send His Son. God took the initiative to draw you to Himself. God gave you the ability to repent and to understand the Gospel. Remember Jesus said, no one can come to the Father unless the Spirit draws. He who began a good work in you will perfect it. Faith is a gift. It's from God. And so God is the one who initiates and pursues us. Why? Because He wants relationship with you. It's funny that we're sitting in this building tonight because my wife Dee Dee and I met here at the University of Georgia back in 1981. And one of our first dates was uh, down in Dairy Queen, right down here on Lexington Road. Remember that, honey? And so I pursued her. Why? Because I wanted a relationship with that woman right there. And thankfully, she's now my wife for 27 years. But why did I go after her? Why did I pursue her? Because I wanted relationship. God pursues us because He wants relationship. God pursues us in a lot of ways. He initiates. He reveals Himself. He's all about showing Himself to us. We were going to walk out tonight. It's going to be dark. And you look up. And if it's not cloudy, there's stars. The heavens declare the glory of God. God reveals Himself through creation. God reveals Himself and pursues us through His Word. 
God pursues and goes after people, even sometimes through dreams and visions. There's reports all over the world tonight of Muslims getting saved because they're having dreams and visions of Jesus Christ. God still does that, by the way. That didn't cease with the book of Acts. God pursues through people, putting people in our lives. God pursues us through circumstances, often sometimes through difficult circumstances as a way of God awakening us and getting our attention and saying, you need me. Quit living by yourself. Quit living self-sufficient. And maybe you're here tonight and some, there's some difficult things going on in your life right now. And you're wondering, why is all this happening? That might be God pursuing you, knocking on your door, saying, turn to me, turn to me. Even your being in this room tonight may very well be another way in which God is pursuing you. Some have called God the loving hound of heaven. And I think that's a great description. And God goes after us because why did He put us on earth? What did He create us for? He created us for relationship. That's why we're here on earth. And so this gives living hope because it shows that God cares. And He wants intimacy with you. You're here tonight and there's struggles. There's issues that you're wrestling with. There's emotional pain. Maybe there's physical pain. God wants to be what Psalm 47 says, a very present help in time of need in your life. So that gives living hope. That gives living hope. Some of you are here tonight and maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe, maybe you're religious but you don't know Christ. That's exactly what described David Hall at 17. My dad's a Lutheran pastor. Raised in the church. Went to church every Sunday. Went through confirmation. I was an acolyte, a crucifer. I did all that stuff. And I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I was religious, but I didn't have a relationship. Because no one ever told me that I needed to personally repent of my sins and receive Christ in my life. I just assumed I was a Christian because I went to church and maybe you'd get it by osmosis. No. The Bible says you receive Christ by faith. That you repent of your sins. And I made that decision my senior year in high school. And within the next week or two, I began to experience changes in my life that are unexplainable apart from God. I began to have a hunger for God's Word. I began to see victory in areas that I had struggled in. I began to just deeply desire to know Him better. And so tonight, if you've never received Christ, tonight can be the night that you invite Christ to come into your life and the Bible says He'll come in He'll begin to change you from the inside out. And that can give living hope. Third reason. Why we can have living hope. And this just fleshes out this idea of relationship a little bit more. But what does it say? He caused us to be what? He caused us to be what? Born again. The third reason we can have living hope is because God offers us new life. You say, well, I've heard that term born again before. Didn't Jimmy Carter come up with it? <laughs> no. No. Uh, I've heard about these born again Christians. I, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Yeah, it's right here. Guess who first spoke it? Jesus. <laughs> John chapter 3. Jesus made a very interesting but bold statement. He said, unless you're born again, you shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Whoa. That says that this, whatever this is, better figure it out because if you're born again, you get the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty important, isn't it? That's like eternal life. That's like heaven. If you don't, if you're not born again, you don't get the kingdom of heaven. So in John 3, Jesus said, this is it. This is the essence. This is a bullseye. I bow my. And when you bow my, you want to hit the bullseye. Right, Josiah? You don't want to miss the deer. Well, and so this is the bullseye of Christianity. Born again. What does it mean? Listen very carefully. It doesn't mean that we're physically born a second time. That's not possible. It means this. You're born again spiritually. You see, when we're born into the world physically, through our mother... Our body's alive, but our spirit is dead in sin, the Bible says in Ephesians 2. We're dead in our transgressions and sin. Our spirit is dead, unable to have a relationship with God because we are dead in sin. And when you repent of your sins and receive Christ in your life, and you trust in what Jesus did for you at the cross, the Bible says at that moment in time, your spirit goes from dead to alive. Your sins go from unforgiven to forgiven. Your nature goes from sinner to saint. And you go from being an enemy of God to being a child of God in, the, in a moment. That's what it means. That's what Jesus is referring to when He says, unless you're born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Because if you die dead in your sin, 
Your spirit does not go to be with God. It goes to hell, the Bible says, because that dead spirit can't have communion with God. But once you receive Christ and your spirit is made alive and you're born again because your spirit's made new, that begins that relationship with God that the Bible says will last for all of eternity. And my friends, that gives living hope. Because that means every day you have a relationship with the God of the universe. You can know that you're accepted and forgiven of your sins. I can't wait in a few weeks and, and, and later this uh, spring or summer, can't remember when, I'm going to preach a message on who are you really? Where we get into this whole idea of your identity. What does it mean for the believer's new identity in Christ? What happens the moment that you accept Christ to your identity? Because 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That gives living hope. Fourth reason. We've seen that we have living hope because of God's mercy. Living hope because God pursues us. Living hope because God offers us new life. Is there more? Yeah. Living hope because Jesus rose from the dead. Better buckle your seatbelts. This is good stuff here. Born again. To a living hope through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here we have the greatest event in human history. The resurrection of Christ. We just celebrated this a few weeks ago with Easter. God came to earth as a man. He lived. He died. He rose from the dead on the third day. Christianity and faith in Jesus Christ is rooted in a historical event. It's not a blind leap in the dark when you accept Christ in your life. You're accepting a person who came 2,000 years ago, proved the reality of God, and verified that by His resurrection. The Bible says He it was witnessed by more than 500 people. Even the Jewish historian Josephus, who is not a believer, speaks of the resurrected Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, when you begin to grasp the reality of the historical and intellectual validity for the Christian faith, it gives you such a solid foundation, it will do wonders for your faith. And one of the books in the back that is free today for anybody who needs it is called More Than a Carpenter, written by Josh McDowell, who for two years tried to disprove Christianity. And in the process, he became a Christian because he became convinced that the Bible supported God and Jesus is the Son of God. I told you earlier I got saved, I became a Christian, I received Christ my senior year in high school. I came to college here at the University of Georgia in 1979, and for the first time, my faith was challenged by professors who said things like, well, the Bible's full of contradictions, and nobody believes in the resurrection anymore. And it made me really question, not what I believe, but why I believe. Is there a historical, intellectual credibility to the Christian faith? You bet there is. And it stands or falls on the resurrection. And that can give you living hope, because when you study and investigate and become convinced, like Peter in 2 Peter 1 and 16, he said, we do not follow cleverly invented tales when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, for we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Something about an eyewitness. These were men who saw whether Christ really did rise from the dead. And because they knew for a fact that it was true, they were willing, 11 of the 12 disciples were willing to die and murder's death for their faith in Jesus Christ. And so maybe you're here tonight and you question whether or not this whole Christianity thing is real. Well, what about Muslims? What about Buddhists? Aren't all religions the same? No, they're not. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And he proved his reality by rising from the dead. And there is a lot of evidence supporting his resurrection. So how does his resurrection give us living hope? It gives us living hope because it provides objective evidence that he is who he claimed to be. That he's still alive today and working. And it's through His resurrection that we can be born again because 1 Corinthians 15 says, if Christ be not raised, we're still dead in our sins. He conquered sin and death and Satan when He rose from the dead. And that victory can be ours today. You don't have to stand in shame and guilt and condemnation because Jesus Christ gave you the victory through His resurrection. And furthermore, listen closely. He rose from the dead and then what? He appeared to more than 500 and then it says that he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he left with his disciples the Holy Spirit. There's this thing in Acts chapter 2 called Pentecost. 
Jesus told his disciples, don't even begin to try to look for me or do this thing called witnessing until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon those 120 in the upper room. And they were filled with the Spirit. And they began to go out and boldly live for Christ and proclaim the good news. And I want to tell you today, and I can't wait to preach this, and I think it's our third service, Power for Living, full message on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible teaches that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 8, 9, dwells in every Christ body. So when you receive Christ and you're born again, guess what happens? You receive the very presence and power of God into that Spirit that was dead and is now alive. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, and that gives you the ability to live for Jesus Christ. The first two years of my Christian journey, I was extremely zealous and extremely hungry to know God. But what I did those first two years is I tried hard to be a good Christian, and I got tired real fast. So many people today think that Christian life is just a matter of, well, i got to try hard. No, you don't. If that's your attitude toward Christianity, you don't understand what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a matter of trying hard to be a good Christian. It's allowing the life of Jesus to be lived through you by power of the Holy Spirit. A good way to illustrate this is this power drill. The reason this drill can work so well is because it has a power source. And that power source for you and I is the Holy Spirit. And when you receive Christ, as I said earlier, you receive the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 and 13 says you're sealed with the Spirit till the day of redemption. Ephesians 5 18 says be filled every day with the Holy Spirit. This battery needs to be charged and recharged. <laughs> we need to allow the Holy Spirit to be recharged in our life through the Word, prayer, fellowship, obedience, but without this battery, this thing can look real nice, but it doesn't work. In the same way that you and I cannot live the Christian life the way God intends without the power of the Holy Spirit. I invite you tonight to allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, to welcome the Holy Spirit to fill you, to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, because we desperately need, don't we? Don't we desperately need the Holy Spirit to live a victorious, joyful life obedient, fruitful life. Amen? If that's not enough, there's more. Because the final reason has to do with eternity. What happens when we die? Talked about that a little earlier. Remember our definition of hope? A positive expectation of the present and the what? Future. A positive expectation of the present and the future. So what does this passage teach about the future? It says, born again to a living hope, into an inheritance. Here's the fifth reason we can have living hope tonight. God promises His people eternal life. Notice I said His people. Not every person goes to heaven. Those who are Christ's followers go to heaven. Born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, Kept in heaven for you. This is loaded with amazing truth. First of all, an inheritance. What's an inheritance? An inheritance is something given to another in their will, usually. Okay? That is a legal document that is guaranteed. An inheritance is something that, that one gives to another, usually in their will. Some of which you can receive now, sometimes. And some, usually most, comes later. Same with God. Because of Christ's death, He puts us in His will. And, and, and the inheritance we get as believers is this. Some of it comes now. We've already talked about a lot of that. Some of the inheritance comes now. We get forgiveness of our sins. We get a new nature. We get a new family. We get acceptance by God. We receive the Holy Spirit. But most comes later. And that's when we die. And the Bible says, absent from the body at home with the Lord. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. The ultimate inheritance for the believer comes when we die and the Bible promises that we will live forever with our God in a place called heaven. And look what it says. It's imperishable. It won't fade or perish like food left out of the fridge. <laughs> it's undefiled. It can't be reduced in quality in any way. 
It stays perfect. It's unfading. It won't fade like a painted car. It only gets better and better with time. And then look at this. It's kept in heaven. It's guaranteed. He promises this to you. It's kept in heaven. Like when Jesus said, God to prepare a place. It's there. It's secure. Can't be taken away. And then I love that last phrase. Kept in heaven for you. You can't get any more personal than that. Kept in heaven for you. This is what awaits every believer. Eternity with God. Where there's no mourning, crying, pain, sorrow. Where there's no sin, no cancer, no relational conflict. Isn't that good news? <laughs> Kept in heaven for you. So five reasons we've seen tonight. Five reasons we can have living hope. And I encourage you tonight to ask yourself if you're experiencing this. We can have living hope because God is merciful. Because God pursues us and He's pursuing many of you tonight. God offers new life. All this is possible because Jesus rose from the dead. And God promises His people eternal life. You know where all of this is found? Every bit of this is found at the cross of Jesus. At the cross of Jesus, we see mercy. Jesus was so merciful. He healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He forgave the woman caught in adultery. He looked on the people with compassion. And he, and he said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. If anybody embodied mercy, it was Jesus. Because of the cross, it shows that God pursues us. Because of the cross, He offers new life. He didn't stay on the cross. He rose from the dead. And the cross guarantees that sin, death, and Satan were defeated. And you and I can walk in that victory. It's good news. Where are you at tonight? Are you experiencing living hope? Do you have any hope in your life? Do you know Christ? Do you receive Him? Maybe you did years ago, but you're, you're not walking with Him now. The good news tonight is that if you meet God's condition, there's always room at the cross for you. Let's pray to I'm going to give you just a minute to reflect on what you've heard and really uh, look at your own heart. I'm doing the same thing right now. Perhaps right now, some of you just need to call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you say. There's no magical prayer. It's your heart yielding to Jesus. Repenting, that means to turn from it. Your sin. Just receive the free gift. He's done everything necessary for you to be forgiven and restored. You just have to receive it. Maybe you've been distant from God and you know that. And tonight, just in your own heart, you say, God, I'm sorry. Thank you for being merciful. I want to come back to you in a fresh way. All of us should take a moment and just thank God for this hope that's ours. We love you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for us, the relationship that you've made possible. Thank you for the power of testimony. The Word says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And I thank you testimonies have changed lives that we're going to hear now. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Jerry, would you come on up? Jerry DeBan is one of our elders. And uh, I invited him tonight to share with you uh, what God's done in his life. And I think it'll really reinforce what you've seen in God's Word tonight. Good evening. <laughs> He says I'm on. You're on. Well, this may be, it seem like an odd place to start, but I'm going to start telling my story. The story that happened in 2006 in Katy, Texas. I had been flown out to Texas by the owner of Academy Sports and Outdoors. He wanted to talk to me about a, a position at his company, heading up the market. And I'm sitting in there, and in walks Mr. Geisman, and he gets straight to business. 
throws a notepad on the table, and he said, so, give me an example of your greatest failure in your life. And what did you do with it? Wow, I didn't see that coming. Kind of caught me off guard. And I thought, well, I'll return the favor. So I said, well, actually, Mr. Gotchman, my greatest failure was waiting until I was 18 to get saved. Because if I'd gotten saved three years earlier when I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit first, probably would have saved the lives of the two babies that were aborted because of me. Probably would have spared a whole lot of heartache and years of struggles from my high school girlfriend, Deji Allen. You see, she learned 1 Corinthians 15, 33 the hard way. And it says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. She was misled, all right. I pressured her to go against her Christian faith and have sex before marriage. And then I pressured her to do the unthinkable, and that is terminate two pregnancies by killing two innocent lives. It cost us both dearly. Here I corrupted this sweet young girl, and then I made her an accomplice in killing two people. Oh, by the way, parents and youth, I have found in my life, gravity in dating relationships tends to work. I pulled her down to my level. Seldom does it work the other way around. I was the bad boy that every parent fears their daughter will bring home. No, I wasn't always that way. I was actually born and raised in a small town in Mount Vernon, Arkansas, 8,700 people in to live there, you had to wait till somebody died because they didn't want to be any bigger. It was like our own little neighborhood. And I was really fortunate because I had a very large extended family. I grew up with all my great grandparents, all my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. I lost my first grandparent when I was almost 40, so I really had a strong influence of grandparents and extended family. Now, my sister and I were aware that our mother and dad were struggling in their marriage and things weren't really good home, but being in that town and around the grandparents, they seemed to compensate. They were greatly involved in our life and just smothered us in, in love. Some people would say we were sort of rotten by the, by the grandparents. I was 10, though, when our folks announced we were moving out of state, and that was terrifying to us because everything that we thought of as family was going to be left in Malvern, Arkansas. And we were moving away from our own little neighborhood. And that's when my world went sideways. Um, we had, in our home, we had already known what it was like with the, the verbal and even the physical abuse, but it escalated and got really nasty. And then eventually, my sister and I both were subjected to even sexual abuse by our parents. And what kind of parent does that? Well, they split up when I was 13. Dad remarried about, I don't know, three months after that and pretty quickly immersed himself in his new wife and then soon after that, their daughter. And he completely, from age 13, my dad completely unplugged from my life. All participation, sports events, school functions, fishing, being together, ended when I was 13. I could count on one hand the number of times after that that he and I were even riding together alone in the same vehicle, let alone doing anything. He just, he just unplugged. And my mother wasn't exactly a safe haven either. Um, she was fighting her own demons. She had gotten swept up in this whole women's liberation crusade. and She went through several marriages. I quit trying to remember their names and I just started numbering them. But her jaded view of men extended to me too. I, my wife would say she was a man hater. But anyway, I've been slapped and I've been beaten and screamed at more times than I really care to remember. But I'll tell you the part that I struggled with, that I really struggled with well into adulthood. And that was for years hearing my mother rant 
about what a sorry human being I was and how ashamed she was to have me as her son. I didn't cope with those kind of things very well at that age. And so what happened was I turned into a bitter kid who grew into a very bitter young man. And I acted out in a lot of ways, but I found that I deeply resented anybody I knew, classmates, friends, who had what I perceived to be normal families, a mom and dad, normal family life, and the traditional Sunday dinner after church kind of thing. Church was not for me, by the way. I wanted no part of church. I wanted no part of any God who would let this happen in my life. And I sure didn't want to hear somebody's sappy stories about Jesus loves me. So what happened was I actually started imitating the very environment I came up in. Drugs, alcohol, violence. Now contrast that. Well, it's kind of funny actually, but it's not. My freshman year in high school, I somehow conned Deji Allen into going out on a date with me. She didn't know it. I was high as a kite the first night I went to pick her up. She had no idea. And about two weeks after that, I nearly blew the whole thing with another little brush up with the law when a buddy of mine and I was getting in a car into a roadblock with police met us with the guns drawn. And as it turns out in Texas, by the way, minors in possession of alcohol and running from the police are heavily frowned upon. <laughs> I climbed out of cars before Dukes of Hazard stopped. That was the first time I'd ever been airlifted out a window and slapped face first on the hood and handcuffed. That was a new experience. And sitting in that jail when that officer pushed the phone across after they'd taken my picture and got my autograph and said, now I'm called home. And I pushed that phone back and I said, no, no thank you. Well, let's just say that Deja and I didn't run in the same circles. She was the proverbial church rat. She had grown up from birth around church, gave her heart to Jesus at age nine, in the church every time the doors were open kind of girl. And if her parents had had a clue what kind of boy I was, I would have never gotten in their door the first time. By the time they figured it out, it was too late. Their sweet daughter, their a honor roll student, their all-state choir cheerleader daughter had already had two pregnancies and two abortions. Well, instead of shooting me, which is what I would do to any boy who hurts my daughter, her parents took a very different route. And her mom was a very strong personality in that family, and so we had this confrontation. And Maggie, her mom, it, it went something like this, and I, I, I remember it well. I'm sitting on the sofa in their living room, and Maggie marched in and stopped herself between the television and me. And her conversation began just like this. Young man, my daughter will not marry a heathen, and you, sir, are a heathen. <laughs> and I just know this. If you died on the way home tonight, you'd go straight to hell. You know why I know that? Because you aren't saved. And you need to get saved. What do you say to that? I'm 16 years old. What am I supposed to say? This lady looked 100 years old to me anyway, but she was mean looking. Well, she wasn't through, by the way, which is where my wife gets it. She wasn't through. She said, oh, oh, no, 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 we're not done with this. Here's the deal. You're going to start going to church. We go Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You're going to go one time a week. You pick the day. I don't go to church, ma'am. Then get out of my house and don't come back. That's blackmail. That's right, it is. What's your choice? <laughs> we started going to church. I paid my blackmail. I was... Easy to spot the kid in the back, arms folded, body language that says, I'm not having a good time. Please beat me up, Scotty. <coughs> For two years, I sat through church like that. Two years, I'm hearing things. Made their way in here and down to here and started to change. I started hearing some truth about 
sin and consequences and forgiveness and redemption. Things that started to make sense to me. Well, I don't remember exactly what I told the pastor that night, except I went down front and took his hand. Probably said something like, Maggie says I'm a heathen and now I agree with her. I need to get saved. But anyway, I got saved that night. That night, Daisy rededicated her life. I'd love to tell you from that moment on, we got married that summer, and it was just a storybook ending of how we've lived happily ever after. The truth is, we really struggled. We struggled to make peace with our past and try to deal with it. It was like this elephant in the room we didn't talk about. And for 10 years, we didn't talk about it. We were active in church, we were growing in head knowledge, and we worked, but our service was kind of ineffective because we allowed Satan to burden us down with guilt. And then something really amazing happened. God pursued us, David. He reached out. He intervened. He put people in our path and he put us in a Bible study that finally taught us something that had been there all along. Jesus paid it all. We were already forgiven. And when he died on the cross, he said, it's finished. Not it's mostly finished. He said, it is finished. And when we finally started realizing that truth, God really began to transform our life radically. And in closing, I want to leave you with this thought. We've been married 33 years. God blessed us with three more children, Jacob, Jamie, and Joshua. They love the Lord. They're saved, serving Him. God even led the two of us to help found a crisis pregnancy center in Prattville, Alabama. It's called Grace Place. But only a God, only God has the power to make something beautiful come out of the ashes of our own bad choices, right? How do I know that? Well, I know what it's like to be the throwaway kid. I know what it's like to endure a broken home. It's been 20 years now since I've seen my mother. I asked my sister the other day, how long since you've seen that? 35 years. She beat me on that one. I know what it's like to be consumed with bitterness. I know what it's like to struggle with unforgiveness. I know what happens when one drink and one drug leads to another. I know what happens when sin has its way in my life. But I also know what it's like to be touched by God himself and made completely whole. I know what it's like to be forgiven, to be washed white as snow. No more stain, no more guilt. And I know what it's like to make peace with my past, finally. I know what it's like to be given a brand new life, a brand new identity. I'm not the same guy that slid the car into that roadblock. We aren't the same kids who aborted to babies. What I can tell you is I've been adopted by God himself. I've been redeemed. I've been restored. I've been given a new identity. And I'm a child of the King. Yeah. that you have seen in that that one of our dreams and hopes and living hope is that this be a church for all people no matter their past or their present and that we're going to love people right where they're at and we're not going to shame anyone anything and that um, as God builds testimonies like this in the church there's going to be people here and feel oh, man I can go to that person because they've been through it. they know what it's like and we're going to celebrate now the good news that we've talked about and we've heard fleshed out. And communion is that way. The Bible says that um, when we gather for worship, we're to partake of communion.